This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 34. Welcome to the 34th episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. If you've been enjoying the show, I would absolutely love it if you would take a moment to leave a review and a rating on iTunes. It would help the show to move up in rankings and also help more people find the show. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please stop by the show notes page and leave a comment. I love hearing from you. So you'll find all the episodes at fertilityfriday.com slash podcast. And you can also find me on Twitter at Fertel Friday. And in case you haven't been listening to all the previous podcasts, I've recently created the Fertility Friday Facebook group. So just go to fertilityfriday.com slash community and you'll be redirected to the group. And so you can just make a request, which will come to me and I'll approve you. And the group is still a little small. We're still in the initial phases, but my hope is that with time, we'll be able to build a thriving and supportive community of like-minded women who will help each other along their journey, gaining confidence and understanding using the fertility awareness method. And today, I'm so thrilled to have my guest, Kim Sedgwick, join me on the podcast. Kim and her sister, Amy, are the Red Tent Sisters. And the sisters have created a family business that not only helps women learn holistic, non-hormonal birth control using the fertility awareness method, but a big part of their work is raising awareness about healthy sexuality and providing women and men with healthy, environmentally friendly options when it comes to sex products through their website, ecosex.ca. And so a few months ago, I had Kim's sister Amy on the show, and we talked all about fertility awareness and coming off the pill, and it was awesome. And so in case you missed that interview, uh, just head over to fertilityfriday.com slash Amy and check it out. And today I'm joined by Kim, and we'll be talking all about sexuality. And Kim has been educating women and men for years on all things sex, from gaining confidence in the bedroom to sex toys and different types of sexual play and female pleasure, and everything in between. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Kim. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I can't wait to chat with you. Oh, yeah. No, I was, as I mentioned to you, I've been looking forward all day to chat with you. <laughs> <laughs> so just to kind of get our feet wet, I was wanting to know, you know, what inspired you to head into this field and, and really focus on sexuality and sex positivity? Yeah, so there's a few things. I mean, the first is that I was really lucky with my family and my upbringing. So as you mentioned, I've got my sister, Amy, who's five and a half years older than me, and we now have our business together, but we've always been super close. And then I also have two stepsisters. So I was, I was the baby of the family. And uh, as a result of that, I was very fortunate to uh, learn lots of wisdom from them. I heard all those stories when they were coming home from dates, and uh, I got to uh, read their very well used copies of our bodies ourselves, which every woman well I, I think actually everyone should should have a copy of that book. I have my mom 's original copy from the sixties, which wow. is you know a tiny little book, and then when we had the storefront, we carried the newer version, which is much bigger but yeah, so I had access to all these resources. And just really grew up in a very sex positive household, like my mom and my dad always made me feel comfortable asking any question. And so from a pretty young age, people would come to me, like my friends would come to me with questions and either I would maybe already know the answer because it's something I had already asked my parents. And if it wasn't something I did know the answer to, then I had access to all these books. So I, I, yeah, as a, uh, as a young woman, I'd already sort of developed this relationship where I felt like more conversations around sex needed to happen. And then when I had one of my first sexual partners, I had what I now know is a G-spot orgasm. But at the time, I didn't know what it was. It wasn't one of the things covered in our bodies ourselves. <laughs> and so I actually thought that I'd wet the bed. Oh, man. And I was so unbelievably ashamed. I felt like my body had betrayed me. And it really inhibited my ability to have sexual pleasure for a number of years going forward because I was just so terrified of it happening again. And I think that experience really made me realize that even for me, having grown up in the sex positive household, I had so much access to information. There's still so much I didn't know about my body. And then I went and did a women's studies degree at uh, Dalhousie University. So I was out in Halifax. And there's this fantastic store called Venus Envy, which I think is such a great name for a store. <laughs> 
And so the setup of Venus Envy is they had all these resources at the front that a lot of my professors would order their books, their course books through there to support them. So I would go down there to buy my textbooks. And then I was like, oh, look at all that fun stuff in the back. So I was looking at all these dildos and various other products. And so became really interested in opening something similar when I came back to Toronto. And I'm just really lucky that Amy had similar interests when she found out about the justice method. And so she was getting really passionate about natural birth control. I was interested in the stuff around sexuality. And uh, at the time, having just graduated from my women's studies degree, sadly, there's not a lot of job opportunities for a new women's studies grad. So Amy was letting me live in her basement very kindly. And uh, one night we're up late chatting. And then I was like, you're interested in, you know, this natural birth stuff. I'm interested in in uh, sexuality and the two things came together and we always say it's very fitting that from the time we came up with the idea to the time we opened the doors to Red Ten Sisters was exactly nine months and it really feels like we birthed a baby. Wow. Wow. (laughs) That's so symbolic. I love that. So So when you were talking I kind of thought about the taboos that are still there on sexuality I thought it was really interesting that you said coming from a home that was so open that Mm -hmm. obviously there was still things that you didn't know. And I've said on the podcast before, I think the majority of my education came from the Sunday Night Sex Show with Sue Joyce. Sue Joyce Vincent. Oh gosh, I love her. I actually got to meet her a couple of years ago. We were on a Rogers TV show together. Oh, wow. And I was like so starstruck. I was like, oh my goodness. Can I? Yeah. I got a photo with her and I have it up in my office. It's like my kind of, yeah, one of the happiest moments in my sex education career. But yeah, because she was one of the few amazing resources for sure. And one of the things that I wonder is, where are young people getting their knowledge now? Um, <laughs> so I, I guess one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, you know, why do you think that straight talk about sex is still so taboo? Even though sex is everywhere, it's it's still not really discussed in an open, honest, and educational and positive type of way. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, I always say we live in this sex saturated environment, and yet candid conversations happen so rarely. And, you know, part of it is that we're still learning about female sexuality. I mean, I was just reading an article the other day, there's an amazing artist, um, I think her name is Sophia Wallace, who came out with this campaign around the clitoracy, so understanding Mm. the clitoris. Because there's still this idea that it's this tiny little nub where, you know, in reality, it has a huge number of nerve endings, right? And it's definitely not just this tiny little dot. But, you know, they only really discovered how the clitoris works in 1998. And she said on her website, you know, we had at that point, we'd already put the man on the a man on the moon, you know, we've got the internet, we've got all these things. And yet we still don't understand how women's bodies work. And for me, that is really symbolic, that there's just so little information out there. And there's so much misinformation. That's the problem is people aren't even saying like, oh, I don't know. People think they know. They think it's this tiny little nub when in reality it's not. So yeah, there's a huge amount of misinformation. And one of my big concerns is how much information is coming from pornography. Pornography is interesting because we actually carry porn at Red Ten Sisters. Um, So I'm not anti-porn by any means. But I do have some real concerns around pornography, particularly mainstream pornography, in terms of how little diversity is represented. You know, almost all women's genitalia looks exactly the same when it comes to porn, where in reality, obviously, there's huge diversity. There's an amazing book called Petals that's a photographic series of different vulvas. And I remember showing this book in some of the workshops that I ran and, and just seeing customers look at it. And we would have women just start bawling in the middle of the store because they would have this moment where they realized that they were, quote, normal. Like, I think so many women have so much shame around their bodies because they think that they don't look like what they're supposed to look like. And the, um, the relief that comes from seeing that kind of diversity is so powerful. So my thing with porn is, as I said, I'm not anti-porn. What I want to actually see is more good feminist porn that actually showcases diversity because I think that there's real power in seeing different sexualities depicted on screen. Um, so that's why I'm really happy to see that there is a lot of alternative porn that's being made by women that's that has that as it, its focus is to try and, and showcase that diversity. Because, yeah, I think that's where a lot of people are getting their education from now is through porn. So unless that's going to change, let's just add to the conversation because I don't think it's actually going away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you bring up such a good point. And it 
it really resonated with me because I remember my junior high sex ed class and I, rem- I remember in our class they had this diagram of, of the vulva which of course they didn't call the vulva <laughs> I learned that word yeah. in university <laughs> I didn't know what a vulva was <laughs> but uh, they showed the vulva and the clitoris was actually a little dot essentially mm-hmm. and I actually remember going home and taking a mirror and looking at myself and being really confused because I didn't obviously have a dot. (laughs) (laughs) And so I think what you're saying is so powerful because women don't have the opportunity to see much variety when it comes to vulvas and to actually see that your clitoris and your labia, they're normal and, but you know, they're all, we're all different, but there's different ways it can look. So I I think that's such an important point that you make there. And I guess that kind of leads into, because you've already touched on it, but maybe we can get into it a little bit more. What would you say are some of the biggest challenges or most common challenges that women face with regards to their own sexuality? Yeah, I mean, I would say one of the biggest one is women feeling like there's something, quote, wrong with them if they can't orgasm during intercourse. And I feel like we live in such an intercourse-focused society that, yeah, a lot of my clients are women in heterosexual relationships. And they assume, because when you look at media in the movies, I would say, like, you know, after three minutes of thrusting and suddenly, magically, they both come at the exact same time. And it just, you know, it doesn't happen like that for most people, but it's setting up such an unrealistic expectation because, again, that's all we see. And for someone when that might be the case, but it's not the case for a lot of women and because, but because that's all they see, they think there's something wrong with them. And so a lot of the work that I do with clients is helping them to understand that, you know, they say roughly 70% of women need some kind of clitoral stimulation in order to orgasm. And so for women who are having intercourse, generally speaking, the clitoris isn't being stimulated in that way. And I think that it's really hard for women to be able to ask for the kind of stimulation they need in order to reach orgasm. So whether that's using toys or using their own hand or asking their partner to use their hand. Because again, there's, I mean, I feel like this is changing a little bit. For the longest time, it really seemed like sex toys were set up as this thing that only single women needed. Mm -hmm. Um, And that there was like a real stigma around that. Because we opened our store eight years ago. And I remember the number of times that women would be like, oh, well, I have a husband at home. I don't need a vibrator. Like that was one of the most common responses. (laughs) And it was like, well, there's many, many scenarios where these toys could be used, whether it's with your partner or without your partner. Because I think there's also a lot of stigma around masturbating if you have a partner that somehow you're only ever supposed to be having sexual relationships with your partner. And then, yeah, masturbation, I think, is another huge taboo. So I'm really happy to see that changing. I feel like there's a lot of toys now that are designed specifically for partner play. So that sort of helped to, to destigmatize toys. So yeah, I'd say that's a big one for, for women is just this idea that they're supposed to be able to orgasm simultaneously with their partner during their intercourse and that they have a hard time asking for anything else. And I guess something that's sort of related to that is that there's still a lot of stigma around oral sex and this idea that these things are the precursor to the main event. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's a book I absolutely love that's called She Comes First by Ian Kerner. And his whole philosophy is that we should treat what we consider foreplay, so things like manual stimulation and oral play, as the main event, rather than seeing them somehow as the precursor to something else. And so yeah, I, I do a lot of work around trying to broaden our definition of what sex is because I think as I said it's been so focused on intercourse and for a variety of reasons that's really problematic Mm -hmm. I think it's it's intercourse is real sex and then everything else isn't isn't even though it's sex it's under the umbrella of sex (laughs) should be on the menu it's not considered to be sex that leads me into when I, you know, because you're, you're so fam- familiar with fertility awareness, obviously, throughout yeah, the years. Sure. Mm-hmm. And I know what many people consider to be a drawback of considering this method is that whole concept of abstinence. So mm-hmm. uh, obviously, when it comes to the fertility awareness method and what I talk about on the podcast, it's really up to the, the couple to decide what they're going to do during their fertile window. So I, you know, not everybody abstains, but one of the things that I think is really interesting is that there's this connotation that abstaining from quote unquote intercourse, penile vaginal intercourse would be a negative thing. Uh, And I think as you've alluded to, there's so many more options that don't involve intercourse that are just as much, if not more fun. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so maybe you could talk a little bit about how actually 
not having intercourse during that fertile window, but still engaging in different types of sexual expression could actually help and benefit the relationship and in, in, in for some couples. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm so glad you asked because that's one of my favorite things to talk about is because I've had so many of Amy's clients and other people who use fertility awareness tell me that that's actually had the opposite effect, that it's actually made their sex life so much better. Um, so rather than being a drawback, it's actually been an unexpected bonus and a real gift. And I think that happens for a few reasons. So certainly one of them, I think, is that, yeah, when you take intercourse off the table for at least part of your cycle, then it really forces you to be more experimental and to try these other things. And then you might discover, oh, I do actually enjoy this more, right? So I think that's a big piece of it. And I also think a huge piece of it is around communication, Mm -hmm. that fertility awareness really forces a kind of communication that might not happen otherwise. I remember a little while ago, reading a quote from Dan Savage, and he said, I can't remember the exact quote, but it was something to the effect of, you know, the reason people who are gay have better sex is because they're forced to have a dialogue that you don't have to have in a heterosexual relationship. He said something like, you know, when you first get into bed with a partner, that's the beginning of the conversation because there's no tab A meets tab B. Like there's no, (laughs) you know, obvious predetermined idea of how this is going to happen. And as we've talked about, because in heterosexual relationships, there's so much focus on intercourse and this like assumption that if you're going to have sex, that is what's going to happen, then you don't have to have a conversation about what it is you actually want to be doing. And I think with fertility awareness, because at least for part of your cycle, you have to have a conversation about what you're going to do, that that kind of ripple effect happens throughout the relationship, that that communication will happen at other times of your cycle as well. And I think that, you know, yeah, the communication is is one of the big, biggest factors in, in terms of having the kind of sex life you want is to be able to communicate what it is you want. And I think it's really unfortunate that we have set up this idea that talking about sex is somehow unsexy, right? That mm-hmm. like, you should just magically know what it is that your partner wants. When in fact, the exact opposite is true that I think having a conversation around what you want to have happen is the sexiest thing you can possibly do and is going to be the key component to actually getting that. Mm-hmm. There's so many things flying through my head. I can't. <laughs> Let me tell you, there's like... So one of the things that was flying through my head was women who are fully in their 20s and even possibly 30s and have never had an orgasm. Mm -hmm. And we talked a little bit about the media and and how it portrays female pleasure and mainstream pornography. And generally, those women look like they're having a great time without a whole lot of variety or anything like that. And you also mentioned how women are often kind of afraid to actually ask for what they want. And then I would even add, if you've never had an orgasm, you may not know what you want. And Mm -hmm. so um, maybe you could speak a little bit to that and, and how problematic that can be. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've certainly experienced that with with clients. I've had women who are even older than that, who've never had an orgasm. Um, And I think, yeah, getting back to that statistic around the 70%, that if they've only ever had sex in one particular way, that it's very easy for that to not happen. And it's also really hard to ask for what you've never experienced, right? Like if you've never actually had the thing that makes you feel good, you don't even know what to ask for that's going to make you feel good. And I think a lot of that comes back to, you know, women not feeling comfortable masturbating. And so they're not actually exploring their body and they're not getting a chance to try those things. And again, I think it goes back to the communication piece that it's really hard to to be able to say, oh, that's actually not working for me. Can you try this? And being able to offer feedback in a way that's constructive. And one of the things that I often teach with clients that I think is is really important is how to ask questions that are open-ended. Because I feel like often when partners ask questions, it's like, oh, do you like this? Well, you're not going to want to say no to that, right? (laughs) Even if it's not feeling that great and you're given the option of saying yes or no, it's really easy to fall into the trap of saying yes, especially as women. I think we're such people pleasers by our nature and, and we're really scared of hurting people's feelings. And so... If you're not given the option to actually elaborate on what might feel better and you're scared of this this criticism, then it's really hard to explore. And so one of the things I really try and encourage people to do is to find ways to explore 
that don't feel like they're going to be criticizing a partner if it doesn't work. And I think that there's a lot of fear around trying new things because if you don't like it, you're not going to want to say you don't like it, right? Yeah. So I think if we can remove that anxiety around having to provide feedback, positive or negative, then it really opens up more possibility for experimentation. Because as you said, like there's some women who don't even know what they want and you're never going to learn if you don't try things. But it's understandably hard to try things if you're worried about having to say no to something you don't end up loving. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, of course, is if you're not really enjoying yourself and you're not really having an orgasm, but you're pretending that you are, that's a huge issue. And it's, you know, this is, this is a, I guess, one of the experiences that I've had is uh, with like friends of mine who maybe haven't had, they didn't have orgasms for a while. And there was always this, well, but it's, it's still fun. It still feels good. Mm-hmm. Until you have your first orgasm. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, because if you if you have orgasms during sexual activity, they're fun. And yeah. uh, you don't, not to, I mean, it's, it's not to say that it's goal oriented, but I think that it's fair to, to want to, to have pleasure and to want to have orgasms. And so, uh, I it, I find that it changes after that because then after you start having orgasms, you you want them and so you figure out how to have more. <laughs> and it's not just okay to have sex every single time and not have orgasms. And the interesting thing is that's you know so this is an issue that affects so many women. But could you imagine uh, men who? It, it, what if it was normal for men not to have orgasms and to pretend that they did and to not. To, to hear a man say, oh, well, you know, it's still enjoyable. I, I just don't think that that would, it's just, it wouldn't happen, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's it sets up a really problematic relationship dynamic if you're essentially lying to your partner, right? Like no. if you're claiming to have a good time when you're not, and I'm certainly guilty of this. I spent a long time telling partners that I was enjoying things while I wasn't. And then I started to realize that I was selling them short that like, if I wasn't giving them the opportunity to try to do things that would feel good, right. And so I think a lot of women, again, myself included for a long time, like felt like I was, I was doing the right thing, right. And somehow being nice by telling my partner I was enjoying something when really I was just sending them on a, on a wild goose chase, making them think that they were doing something that I enjoyed, when in reality, I really wasn't. And I think it's interesting, you brought up the goal oriented piece of it. Because I think that that's such a hard line to walk, right? Like it's, I obviously am very much in favor of women having orgasms. And at the same time, it concerns me when you become, we become so fixated on a particular sensation that we get so into our head. And I mean, all the research that, you know, around sexuality and how much of it is psychological. And, and so if you're worried about not having an orgasm, that's going to make you less likely to have one. So it's, I think it's a really fine line of, of um, doing things that are going to lead to an orgasm while also not making that the, the necessary end goal mm-hmm. every time. Well, and I, it reminds me of uh, what you said at the very beginning of the podcast when you said that because you had this experience where you had this awesome G-spot orgasm before mm-hmm. you knew it was so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, being obviously not wanting to go there again and, and, and preventing yourself to some degree to experiencing mm-hmm. that pleasure. Uh, do you think or do you see with clients uh, kind of that fear of losing control, uh, not wanting to actually open yourself metaphorically speaking to um, all of the the sexual feelings and sexual sensations that you could be experiencing and because you're because of fear I guess you could say for sure because yeah as I said that was certainly my experience like partners would do things that were very pleasurable and I was basically able to override that pleasure with my own need to control my body and so I I was basically able to prevent it from ever getting to an orgasm because I was so in my head and I think I, I certainly have talked to a lot of clients who experience something similar where they're they're scared of the kind of release and they're scared of not being in control. I think that's a big piece. I think for a lot of women, we're so used to controlling our bodies, whether it's through hormonal birth control or through, you know, tampons and other products that basically disassociate ourselves from our bodies and really, yeah, control it and keep them clean. And like, there's this huge obsession with bodily fluids, right? Like the the fact that we literally throw away menstrual products and don't want to be associated with them. I think there's something similar around the fear of what our bodies might do if we, if we really let go. Mm-hmm. And you had brought up oral sex. And as you were talking about that, 
oral sex is, uh, can be this amazing, I mean, all of the different sexual options on the menu are, you know, fantastic, but uh, oral sex is one. I was listening to this podcast, and it was a husband and a wife, so they do their podcast together, and it's, it's oh, about nice. sexuality. Yeah, it's really, it's really cool, but one of the interesting things that I ended up tuning into was this conversation between them where he really enjoys uh, giving her oral sex. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but giving her, uh, pleasuring her that way. And she really is just uncomfortable with it. And she, um, and I think it's interesting because it's a, an idea that I've heard before. And I think it's safe to say that many women, if not most, at some point have worried that they're vulvas look weird or smell weird or <laughs> because of all the negative connotations ar around vaginas and so it, it it wouldn't be such a shock that many women might not be open to that experience because they're afraid they're like what well, why would you want to go down there um you know nervous about it smelling or I look funny or whatever. I have an ugly vagina or whatever it is. So maybe you can speak to that a little bit. For sure. Yeah. And again, this is something that I had a hard time with for a long time um, was that I when partners wanted to go down on me. I was like, why would you want to do that? I smell bad. It looks funny. Like it took me, I had so much body shame again, despite all of these positive images the negative images are so pervasive in our society. So I think it's not surprising that a lot of us um, have internalized that idea. And I feel like there's also been so much stuff in the media around men not wanting to, per, uh, to for perform oral sex, that somehow it's emasculating and there's like a whole other thing around, around that. But I think for, yeah, for a lot of women, there's a fear around smell, which is huge. I mean, the, the fact that douching and all these feminine hygiene products are so popular. And I always want to tell women the vagina is a self-cleaning oven. You don't need anything. <laughs> it making it worse. Say, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the fact that those products are so popular, I think really speaks to the degree to which women are concerned about that. And, you know, I think like everything around sexuality, there's going to be some men who enjoy it and some men who don't and some women who enjoy it and some women who don't. But I do think that there's a lot of people who are not performing this um, this uh, type of sexual pleasure out of a fear that might not be true. Like the number of times I assumed my partner didn't want to go down on me when in fact they actually did. And I was really denying them that pleasure and that opportunity to provide pleasure for me, which they really wanted to do. And they certainly didn't think my Volvo was ugly and they didn't <laughs> think it smelled bad. That was That was all me. And so it took a lot of unlearning for me to get comfortable with that. And I've had the same experience with clients as I said, that you know that book pedals and other resources like that that I think can really help to showcase the diversity. I think that's a big part of it. And then yeah, yeah, I'm I just hit the hit, keep hitting them over the head with this idea of like you, your vagina is not dirty enough. But I think that that's a really pervasive view around women's bodies, and that's something that I would really love to see change. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I can't help but think about the vagina monologues mm -hmm. so when I was in university I used to go every year and it was if anyone has not had an opportunity to see the vagina monologues but you can or you can look it up where you live in your community uh, and you've ever had any of if anything that we're saying today is resonating with you go and check it out or buy the book because it was just I always found it to be so interesting because it just really gave the gamut of the different ideas and thoughts and situations associated with your vagina. And uh, it, it <laughs> and in the poetry, the vagina has a voice and the vagina talks about what she wants and what she doesn't want. And, <laughs> and it's, uh, I mean, I guess if you haven't seen it, it sounds cheesy. She was like, oh, she's, the vagina talks about what she wants. That's weird. But it's actually the coolest thing ever. And it kind of just gets you out of that weird space that we've been trained to think our vaginas are dirty and ugly and bad and just really gets us to a different place where we can appreciate them for everything that they do vaginas do a lot man they're, they're, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're hard working <laughs> they're hard working yeah <laughs> yeah um so for women listening then who might not be getting as much satisfaction from their sex lives with their partners how would you start the conversation with them or what suggestions would you have uh, to help them maybe gain that confidence in asking for what they want and, and or even exploring and finding out what they what they want? 
Yeah. So, I mean, it depends on their, their situation. Cause I find for some women, it's actually helpful to do exploration on their own. Some women prefer to do it with their partner. So that really depends on the person. And so if they were to do it by themselves using either a hand or a toy, and I just want to briefly mention that, uh, we talked a lot about how we live in this intercourse focused society and that's considered real sex. I think there's also a real stigma around thinking that orgasming from a toy is not real. It's like a mm. fake orgasm. I hear that from a lot of women of like, oh, I don't want to use that during real sex. Mm. Um, so I think we really need to get rid of that idea. So either using a hand or a toy to, to explore by yourself. And as I said, I think for some women, if it's been a long time in particular that maybe they haven't experienced an orgasm and it's become a real source of um, of I guess, well, like if it's really been internalized of a fear that they're never going to be able to, like I have that with a lot of my clients, they're like, it's just never going to happen. And so the stress of it makes it, as I said, less likely to happen. So for some women, not having the stress of being with a partner and feeling like they need to perform can sometimes help. So I do often recommend trying this on your own. So using, as I said, either a toy or your hand, and then also giving your body enough time to actually register what's happening. So what I mean by that is I feel like we often rush it and we expect things to happen really quickly. I remember I had a client the other day and she was telling me, she's like, oh, I don't, I don't orgasm quickly enough. After two minutes, nothing's happened. And I was like, do you realize how long it takes for most women to orgasm? And I was like, okay, if you tell me in five hours, you're still not orgasming, we'll have another conversation. But like, so really giving yourself the amount of time. And I think that there's so much pressure for it to happen within a certain period of time. Um, and so often when I talk to women, I hear that like, they're, you know, they're rushing to have an orgasm 10 minutes before they're scheduled to have a dinner party. I'm like, that is not the time to be trying this. So really carving out a period of a day to dedicate to this. And there's a couple of things in that. One is that if you dedicate a particular period of time, you're saying this is a priority. You're actually saying my sex life and my pleasure is important enough that I'm going to carve out two hours on my Saturday. And I don't care if the groceries don't get picked up and the house doesn't cle get cleaned. My sexual pleasure is important enough that I'm going to carve out this time. And I feel like that's really symbolic I think it really sets the tone for how important this is in someone's life. So I'd say, yeah, so I'd a period of time, turn off your phone so that there's no, you know, and all the Twitter and the Facebook and all of that so you don't have distractions because I think we live in this like crazy culture where we're supposed to be dual tasking all the time. So really focusing just on what it is that you're doing. So again, yeah, whatever tools that you need. Lubricant, I think, is also huge for a lot of women, particularly if you are breastfeeding, menopausal, any situation where there's hormonal fluctuations. If you're on hormonal birth control, that will certainly affect it. Certain medications will make a big difference. I'm a huge lube fan. I can't talk about lube enough because for me, it made such a world of difference. And here's another stigma. I feel like there's a lot of ideas around women that if you are not naturally providing lubrication for yourself, that there's something wrong. There's not necessarily any correlation between arousal and the amount of arousal fluid that you have and the amount of uh, vaginal lubrication. So I think luber lubricant can make a huge difference. So yeah, have all your tools. So have your lube and your toy or whatever else it is that you need, whatever you need in order to relax. So whether that's music, you know, um, some erotica, having a bath, any of those things. But honestly, I think the biggest piece of it is just carving out that time, making a date for yourself and just saying, this is important enough that I'm going to dedicate time to it. And I'm not going into it with a particular goal. I'm not going into it saying that, you know, it has to end in orgasm. What it should end in is knowing more about your body. And that will be one stepping stone to something else. So it's it's really about gathering information about what all the things are that provide pleasure. Because the number of erogenous zones that you might have that you might never have discovered and you wouldn't discover in five minutes. Sometimes it's going to take a whole afternoon of self-exploration. I think it's it speaks to our culture when everything is supposed to be really fast. Yes, instant gratification. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that... When when I think about sex scenes and on TV and and porn and everything like that, there's a few things that strike me. So as we've talked about, one of the things that strikes me is that it's always missionary and she's always loving it and she always mm -hmm. they always have their joint orgasm at the same time within two minutes. So we've talked a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I see or don't see, there's no communication. Obviously, um, yeah. you just fall into bed and there's no protection. There's no conversations around birth control or condoms, uh, STIs. Uh, sometimes you'll see a condom pack depending on the show, but when it comes to general media, there's no, there's none of that. 
And I, <laughs> and I have to say, so when I was younger and I used to watch Degrassi High, the old Degrassi High, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the sex scenes in that particular show were a little bit more realistic. There mm-hmm. was, in the sense of, there was that awkward moment where you had to put the condom on and that kind of stuff. Whereas we're not really seeing that. It's just this pure, lustful, perfect sexual moment that happens so quickly and as you were talking about carving out time I think that as you had and also as you had talked about about changing our idea of what sex should look like obviously a lot of women don't orgasm within two minutes because it (laughs) because it takes a bit longer to get aroused I I remember someone using the analogy of like a crock pot like we're like crock pots I I remember hearing someone say (laughs) foreplay starts in the morning like if you take out the trash like (laughs) there's a lot of emotional stuff that goes on right Um, and what if we stopped thinking that sex should be this 10 minute intercourse rabid crazy fast testosterone driven situation and what if it was more of a a period of time that we spent together and intercourse is could be part of it but it doesn't there could be lots of things it could take an hour and a half it could take two Mm -hmm. hours and that could be okay yeah (laughs) it's so funny I suddenly had this memory I uh, I had a partner a number of years ago and we actually did have a conversation about what we liked and what we didn't like. And I, he was like, so what do you like? And I told him and I was like, and yeah, if you do all those things at once, I'll orgasm really, really quickly and then it'll be done. And he's like, he just gave me this look and he's like, why would I want it to happen quickly? Wouldn't it be better if it could last longer? And I just had this moment of like, yeah, I never, like, I love that it had never dawned on me that like, why was I trying to give him instructions to make it happen as quickly as possible, as if it was some sort of chore or something that like had to get crossed off the to do list. And I think that, yeah, we do live in this society where everything's supposed to happen really quickly. And that we also expect women to get aroused really quickly. And then, you know, of course, every woman is different, but most women, it takes a while for us to get turned on. And if we've just put our child to bed and like barely wiped, you know, washed our hands after changing a diaper, it's hard to suddenly be in the mood, right? Like there's got to be some transition period. And I think that, as I mentioned, I really like the idea of changing some of these activities like oral sex and manual stimulation into the core play. But I think to add to that, we need true foreplay, like things that happen before we're touching the genitals, things that happen before we're doing any of the the actual sex piece of it, that we need to be creating that intimacy because it's really hard to, yeah, to switch gears. And I think we expect ourselves to suddenly just forget all the long list of things we're supposed to be doing and to get in the mood without any transition. Well, and I thought it was really interesting what you said of give because knowing what you want, but trying to get it goal oriented and have it done and give them instructions. Mm-hmm. And what came to my mind was wanting to make it so that you're not a burden on him. Mm. Right. Not wanting yeah. to put him out because mm-hmm. God forbid it takes <laughs> half an hour of fun sexual play for me yeah. to have an orgasm. Like how hard, how, how bad for you to, <laughs> to have to have sexual activity with me for longer, you know, <laughs> but that's kind of how we're trained and that's how it is in the movies. And I've listened to lots of comedy that's like, well, I'm going to, you know, I got mine. Did you get yours? Like all that kind of stuff. And it puts a lot of pressure on, on something that, we do have control over to some extent, but at the same time, I, it takes how long it takes. Yeah, it does. And I think it's really limiting to see it as like, I'm doing this for you. Yeah. As if it's just one person who's getting pleasure as opposed to how can we make it pleasurable for both people? And maybe one person is getting more of the direct stimulation, but that doesn't mean it can't be really enjoyable for both people involved but I think we have this real like tit for tat like I did this for you now you have to do this for me and this really one-sided view of activities like cunnilingus or fellatio that it's like oh I'm doing this for you like it's a chore as opposed to seeing it as something that you're doing because it also provides you pleasure to pleasure your partner Mm -hmm. well that's a really good point because it it is fun to pleasure your partner Mm -hmm. it's it's yeah and I haven't met very many men who don't actually enjoy giving pleasure to their, to their partners. It's a, it's a thing, ladies. (laughs) They like it. (laughs) It's 
really hot to see your partner get turned on and orgasm. Like that's, and you know, I think at the same time we can point out that there's sometimes there's some logistical, there's some, you know, practical things you maybe need to consider, but those are not insurmountable. And that's where, you know, certain um, props and things can make it more pleasurable and make it more comfortable. But the act in and of itself of pleasuring your partner is pretty awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, couldn't agree more. One of the questions that just came to mind as well is what if you have a couple that seems to be or they say they are kind of sexually mismatched where one person really wants to do something and the other doesn't really not really interested whatever it is one person wants oral sex the other person doesn't one person wants to try anal sex the other person isn't interested or even maybe it's gotten to the point that one partner feels like it's just going to be this this way however this the sex script is it's just going to be this way forever and they you know they start to lose hope uh maybe you could speak to that a little bit for sure yeah so i mean when it comes to mismatch in terms of maybe activities that people want to try i always come from a place of course you should never ever do anything you genuinely don't want to do that's that's sort of a given that said i feel like often we don't want to do things out of fear And it makes sense that we're scared to do a lot of sexual activities because we don't really know that much about them, right? And there is so much misinformation around sexuality. So what I always try and do if a couple comes to me and, yeah, one person is interested in something. So let's let's use anal sex because I think that's actually one of the things I hear the most often is one person wants to try it and the other doesn't. And typically it's in my my situation, it's men coming and their female partner doesn't want to do it. And that makes so much sense to me because until I got into this industry, all the depiction is I'd ever seen of anal sex was that it was painful for women, that it was something you did for me. It was like, oh, it's a gift. Like it was a Valentine's Day present. <laughs> like I'm going to do this thing for you begrudgingly. So it makes total sense that women have a reservations around this because why would you want to do something that you've only ever heard is going to be painful and unpleasant and you just kind of have to like grin and bear it. And so what I always try and talk to women about is the ways that it can be really pleasurable and that anal sex, when done properly, should never, ever, ever hurt. Now, after all that information, if I show them instructional videos and I talk about the importance of lube and taking time and how you add clitoral stimulation and all these things, if they're still not into it, then that couple has to decide whether that's something that um, they can, like, depending on why it is that that partner wanted um, anal sex in the first place, maybe that kind of stimulation can be achieved in another way. But I often find that it's the lack of information that's the real barrier, that there's a mismatch because maybe one partner's heard more about it and has heard something really positive. Like, as I said, again, in my situation, it's often the man who maybe is more interested in anal sex. And so he's heard all these great things about how wonderful it is, and she's only heard negative things. And so if I can help to bridge that gap in terms of the information so they're on the same page, then I think that makes a big difference. Another thing, though, that a lot of couples come to me for is a mismatch in libido. So one partner is more interested in having sex more frequently than the other. Um, And I think with that one, I often talk to them about what is it that they're really seeking. And what I mean by that is we tend to tie up the sexual release and the, the, the physical orgasm with intimacy as all the same thing, right? That that's all part of sex, which it is. But those things can also be separated out. So for instance, if one partner has a higher libido, maybe they actually just need the physical release, in which case maybe they can achieve that on their own through masturbation. Or maybe what they're looking for is to have more intimacy. And so that can be achieved in other ways that are not generally focused. So I think it's getting really clear about what it is you're looking for. And that, again, getting back to this communication piece that I think it's really easy for one thing to be compars- like to, to get meshed up with other things and it's really about extricating those two things and then figuring out, okay, what is it you really want and are there other ways that that need can be met? Mm-hmm. That's such a good way of looking at it because if you find out what it is that you're really seeking, you can really find more than one way to achieve that same goal instead of it all being focused on the sex. So exactly. that's, I really like that. Mm-hmm. And many of the listeners, or some of the listeners at least, may have been struggling with infertility. And in that sense, sex is really goal-oriented. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm just trying to get the orgasm. Now we're also trying to make a baby. 
Yeah. And that many couples in that situation, sex becomes more like a chore that they have to do and get it over with. And so if you've ever worked with couples who are struggling with that experience, what suggestions would you have for somebody to, to help maintain the, the, the pleasure and the fun in sex while mm-hmm. also having this big looming goal <laughs> over it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really tricky one, and we do get a number of, of clients come to us for that because of the nature of the work that we do that a lot of people are coming to us for fertility counseling. And you're right that sex can really become a chore. And I'd say it it relates a lot to what I was just talking about in that a lot of times when couples come to us and they, they talk about the, the challenges around sexual intimacy when they're trying to conceive is that you know, maybe they're limiting when they have intercourse to, you know, the fertile window into a certain time in their cycle. And then the rest of the time, they're not having intercourse, they're not having sex. And as a result of that, they're not also doing all the intimacy building things that often happen with sex. And so it's like, they've, they're focused so much on that small window. And then the rest of the time, they're not doing any of the things that maintain that connection. And so I really like to talk to them about how can you maintain that intimacy and that sense of connection throughout your entire cycle. And maybe it's not always leading to intercourse, right? Because it also ties into this whole goal-oriented idea that it always has to look a certain way. So what are the other activities that you can be doing? And this is a great time to be doing things like oral sex and manual stimulation and all these kinds of other things. That's, you know, ways to, to really be exploring. But yeah, I'd say a big piece of it is that there's so much focus on the intercourse and then they're not doing it the rest of the cycle. And so then they're not doing any of the activities that are associated with sex that help to maintain that sense of connection. Well, one of the questions I always see related to this topic when you're trying to conceive is what position you're supposed to have sex in to, to make the babies. And I always find it really interesting because in my logical mind, I think to myself, okay, so let's say for example, the intercourse takes 10 minutes. I'm just going to throw that out there. So how would it matter what position you're in for the first nine? (laughs) (laughs) So I always wonder about that because obviously it wouldn't make a difference. And then I don't even know how much of a difference it makes in general. And so I find that whole idea potentially to be quite limiting. I'm guessing, I don't, I don't know, but I'm guessing, and maybe you could speak to this if you've had clients that have experienced this, but that you're trying to have a lot of missionary sex and it's missionary all the time, but it doesn't have to be missionary the whole time. I mean, if you feel comfortable that that is the best way to, to, to implant and, and if that's where you want him to ejaculate, fine. But I think that there's still room to, to negotiate things. And I I find those ideas to be really strange. (laughs) Yeah, no, I totally agree because I think there's also this idea that, yeah, that you're only doing the the intercourse because it's all about, you know, the ejaculation and that part of things. You can still be doing lots of other things beforehand. Yeah. To make it more pleasurable. So whether that is incorporating manual stimulation or oral play um, toys, like why, why can't you be using a toy while having intercourse, right? Like there's absolutely no reason why you can't do all these other things to make it more pleasurable. But yeah, I understandably it becomes really, really limited in terms of the, the activities that people are doing because they're, they're doing it for a particular goal. And so, yeah, I try and think about what else can you do in that particular time? And then what else can you do the rest of your cycle so that you're still enjoying time with your partner? Yeah, I think those are such great suggestions. And I hope that it benefits some of our listeners who are experiencing fertility challenges, because it just puts such a strain on your sex life to make it so that it's, it's no longer just about fun and sex and enjoyment. Now it's about Get making a baby so it can definitely change things mm-hmm. so as we're coming towards the end of our interview I, I wanted to ask you about sex toys and I, I remember a long time ago I went to two different sex toy parties so I went to one sex toy it was probably either somebody was getting married and it was this or that or whatever but I, they were very different so one of the sex toy parties I went to th- th- no one talked about the safety of the materials or anything and the sex mm-hmm. toys were made of all different kinds of plastics and all kinds of stuff. And then I went to a different sex toy party and the, the, it was totally focused on safety and how when you have toys made of silicone versus other types of materials, uh, how much better that is so that you don't get infections and they don't, you can clean them properly and, and also the different types of lube and how some irritate your 
vaginal flora and make you more prone to, um, you know, different types of infections, I guess you could say again, and, and mm -hmm. disruptions. Anyways, so as you can see my point where I'm going with this, <laughs> <laughs> given that uh, you and Amy have the ecosex.ca website, maybe you could speak a little bit to that and why it's important for us to care what materials are in the sex toys and why we should care about what is in the lubricants and the spermicides and all those types of things. For sure, yeah. One of my favorite things to talk about, you're going to have a hard time stopping me, especially when we're talking about toys. <laughs> um, so a little brief background, which is when we first opened the store, I didn't really know much about sex toy materials in terms of the concerns around phthalates. So this was eight years ago when discussions around parabens and phthalates was still relatively new. It's a lot more mainstream now, but at the time it wasn't as much. And I remember opening the boxes for the sex toys that we were going to be carrying. So we had like demos out on the shelves. So we're opening all these boxes. And I turned to Amy and I was like, there's a really funky smell coming out of these toys and it was like that new car smell which I now know is the off-gassing of the phthalates that were coming off of the jelly toys wow so sex toys are unregulated they're sold as novelty items which basically means they're not intended for use and so they don't have to ensure that the materials that are used to make them are safe for use and I always say, yes, maybe sometimes you're buying a sex toy as a gay gift for a bachelorette, but generally speaking, if you're buying a sex toy, it's going in your body, which means it's going into the most porous part of your body and is probably the area you should be the most concerned about the material so that it's not causing problems. So we made it our mission at our store to only carry toys that were phthalate free. And I'm really happy to say that in the last eight years, there's been a huge shift towards ensuring toys are more safe. A lot more companies are offering phthalate-free materials. So when you're looking for sex toys, the best materials to look for are silicone because it's non-porous, phthalate -free, so really easy to clean. One of my concerns around cleanliness is that Obviously, again, given where this product is going, you want to make sure that it's clean. And a lot of toy companies will sell toy cleaner, which is beyond just being a ripoff because they sell it for like $14.99. It's basically water. Um, they also, it's water and some chemicals. So you're adding chemicals to chemicals and then they're going in your body. So you want to use something that is non-porous so that when you're cleaning it, basically all you have to use is warm water and soap so that you're not adding chemicals. So yeah, the best materials are really uh, silicone. Stainless steel is good. Glass is another good option. There's some wood toys out there. Um, if you're going to use plastic toys, just make sure that they have the phthalate-free symbol on them. And a lot of sex toys do have that symbol on them now. If you're unsure, the other thing is, yeah, get the... Um, the clerk to take the toy out of the box and you'll smell the phthalates. Like it's usually pretty obvious. You can always do the smell test, but yeah, those are some of the materials to, to think about. Then when it comes to lubricants, it still blows my mind. I don't know who's making these products, what they're thinking, because they often put sugar in them oh, and God. you're putting sugar in your vagina. And I'm like, hello, yeast infection. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like there's a great cocktail right there. So, yeah, I'm really passionate make, about making sure people use the right kind of lubricant because, as I said, I think lube can make a world of difference in terms of sex being more comfortable. But a lot of times women are using lube that is not making it more comfortable because it's causing yeast infections and various other, other problems. So look for lubricants that are uh, glycerin and uh, paraben-free because, again, a lot of lubricants have parabens and parabens have been linked to all kinds of health concerns. And I really recommend staying away from all the flavored ones. Yes, they can be fun sometimes, but again, generally they, they're adding sugar to them, so they're causing other problems. Um, One quick interject, just a question about, about lube. But uh, mm. for women who are trying to get pregnant, is there? do you know anything about the lube and not being sperm friendly? Yes, good question. So there has been some research done to indicate that, that yeah, most mainstream lubricants actually kill sperm. So not enough that they're a spermicide but enough that those trying to conceive it might cause problems. Now, I don't think it necessarily causes enough problems in some you know, couples to make it the reason they're not going to get pregnant. But if someone's already struggling, it's certainly not helping matters. Um, so there are some lubricants that are spe specifically formulated for couples who are trying to conceive. The most popular one is Precede, which I don't personally love just because it's got parabens in it. So my personal preference is one called Yes Baby, which is basically an organic version of the same kind of product. 
Love the name. <laughs> I know. Yes, baby is very cute. <laughs> it's actually interesting. Um, I know Amy had a client not that long ago who was struggling to conceive and they were sort of doing some preliminary ideas of like what could possibly be causing the issue. And Amy unearthed the fact that this woman was using coconut oil, which in some cases is a really good option. I don't recommend oils for people using condoms because they're not compatible. There's some debate that maybe coconut oil is okay, but I always figure less air on the side of caution when it comes to condoms and compatibility and not yeah. use oils. But if you're not using condoms, coconut oil can be a really good option. But it's not great for people who are trying to conceive. She stopped using the coconut oil and she got pregnant. So wow. I don't know if that was the thing, but it's it's possible that was the issue. So yeah, if you're trying to conceive, it's a really easy thing to experiment with because it's, yeah, it's just something simple that you can try. Mm-hmm. And then for spermicide, I know uh, I remember I, it's from the Sunday night sex show. I remember Sue Johansson always talking about, you know, Noxinol 9. And so what would, what do we need to know about spermicide so that we're not damaging our flora and making ourselves more prone to yeast infections, all that kind of stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're actually banning the Noxyl 9. So if anything, it's actually really hard to find spermicide now. They're banning it because there were so many health problems with it. Um, and as a result, a lot of people weren't using diaphragms and cervical caps, which is unfortunate because there aren't a lot of good barrier methods. And so it was sad to see that as no longer an option. But there's a company called Kaya. So they make a diaphragm and they also make a gel. They don't actually call it a spermicide because it doesn't kill the sperm because it doesn't have the nanoxyl 9. So they can't call it a spermicide. They call it a gel. But it basically does the same thing. So yeah, that's what you want to look for is make sure that it doesn't have nanoxyl 9 because it's, yeah, it's quite um, hard on your body. Um, but yeah, there are some options out there. As I said, as far as I know, in Canada, the only one that's available is the, the Kaya gel. There might be some other ones in the U.S. Okay. Uh, well, a couple of final questions uh, to tie up the mm-hmm. show today. What would you say, we may have touched on it already, but what would you say is the biggest myth about sexuality that you'd like to see corrected? Oh, well, as I think I've mentioned, there's, <laughs> there's quite a lot <laughs> um, for me to choose one. If I would have to say one, that there's any idea of normal when mm. it comes to sex. Because I can't tell you the number of women who come to me and they think that there's something wrong with them. They think that somehow their bodies are broken because they don't orgasm fast enough or because they don't have enough lubrication or they have too much lubrication or they have too much hair or not enough hair, or whatever it is. I would just love for us to ditch this whole idea of normal and just accept the huge variety and actually not just accept, but celebrate it. That's yeah, that's amazing. That would be that would make sex so much more fun if we could mm-hmm. just like let it go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, because if there was this no idea of normal, then yeah, we could let go of any idea of having to fit in. And then we could do all this exploration that we've been talking about. And if we could really explore it, then yeah, the possibilities are endless. And I would just love to see what that looks like. <laughs> Well, one of the questions I I really wanted to ask you was, and it might be too big, so, you know, but I'm still going to ask it (laughs) because I really want to, but if you could design the sex education program for teenagers across Canada, Mm. uh, what would you include? What would you think? Like, what is like the, it's it's obviously a really broad question, but I guess maybe Mm. top two things that you think like is not there that need to be there or need to be taken out or whatever the case well, I mean, the first big one I would say is that, understandably, and I think this it's good that we focus so much on STI protection and pregnancy prevention, but I don't ever remember hearing about pleasure. Neither <laughs> like, do I. I don't remember there being a single conversation about the fact that sex was going to feel good, right? <laughs> it was all about, like, let's, have make sure, let's make sure you don't have a baby before you want one, and let's make sure you don't get an STI. And as I said, those are important, but like, hello, pleasure is the reason why we do this in the first place. And I would love to see that included in our curriculum. And then the other big one is I still don't actually remember learning any of the anatomical terms or understanding like, yeah, what the parts of my body, like, I feel like they even still use like down there and like all these euphemisms. And I'm like, seriously, we're in health class. Um, and I, I do think that language is powerful. And I think that not having the language to describe what it is you want your partner to do prevents that kind of communication. Because if you're not on the same page about what it is that you're talking about, then you've, you've stopped the conversation before it's even started. Yeah. Well, and I, I can't help but think, okay, if you are in science class, you have a science teacher who took science. If you're in math class, you have a math teacher who took math. If you're in sex ed class, you have someone who didn't really want to teach it, but is forced to. And may not be comfortable talking about sex to begin with. <laughs> I remember my 
yeah, my sex ed teacher just looking so painfully uncomfortable. And I'm just, I would love to have people teaching it. I mean, don't get me started. I would just love if someone wants to hire me to do the sex ed <laughs> for Canada. <laughs> well, let's start with Toronto. Canada's a big country, but I would love to do it at least in Toronto. Because I just think what a difference that would make if the first introduction was someone who's really excited to teach it, who was talking about pleasure, and who was actually using the terms so that they weren't reinforcing the shame. Because I think that's step one of where shame comes from is if we can't even talk about it it must be so horrible yeah well and I just finished doing um just finished releasing I should say a podcast two pod a two series what am I saying a two episode (laughs) podcast (laughs) series on the impact of sexual abuse and sexual assault and one of the things when we get into that conversation about consent is knowing what feels good and knowing what positive sexual experiences should actually look like because no one ever tells you that Mm -hmm. and so then there's so many obviously negative experiences and abusive situations that people experience but they've never been told what a good situation should be and that is so important so I love that you said that and I I wish also that that was part of the the curriculum (laughs) and maybe it will be one day Well, they're changing it in Toronto. I mean, much to a lot of people's dismay. I can't believe the amount of backlash that has happened around the new curriculum. But I I hope that this is the first of many updates. Yes, absolutely. And then the final question of the day for a woman who's listening, we've touched on this a little bit, but uh, just to wrap it up, I think it's a good a good way to do that. But for a woman who's listening and isn't feeling satisfied sexually, what are the final parting words, I guess, that you would give to her? Mm -hmm. So I think the first thing is to to explore for yourself to figure out what it is that you do want. And as I said, I think that's often easier to do by yourself. And then have the courage to actually ask for it. And I know that that's really, really hard. But the reward is you might actually get it. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, if you don't ask for what you want, you won't even have a chance of getting it. So exactly. So Kim, maybe you would like to take a couple minutes and talk a bit about some of the awesome programs that that you do specifically around sexuality. I was looking at the confidence building secrets for pleasuring him and for pleasuring her. So you have programs Mm -hmm. for both men and women, which is awesome. Yes, I do. So that's an online program that was based on an in-person workshop that I ran for a number of years. And I always say that that the best thing you can do for sexuality is this communication and the the confidence, but it's hard to feel confident about something you've never been taught. So I basically think of that course as the sex ed that you should have got. That's the whole pleasure piece that was missing. So it's a six week online course that talks about everything from manual stimulation, oral sex, anal play, different positions, and then uh, toys and lube. Because of course I couldn't have a course where I didn't talk about lube. Um, So yeah, I've got the two companion courses. So those are the online programs that I offer. And then I do uh, one-on-one private coaching as well. And I do that mostly with women and yeah that's all done virtually so I've got clients around the world awesome well Kim thank you so much for being here today it was lovely speaking with you and oh, it was nice meeting for you. many many more hours <laughs> I love this and uh, so nice to talk to someone who's like-minded so yes. thank you so much for having me oh you're welcome and did you want to before we go I guess uh, we've talked a lot about the websites but just to make sure everyone knows where to go to find out more about you and Amy and the Red Ten Sisters, uh, maybe you could just give the websites. And I know you have a YouTube channel and a podcast, so <laughs> take it away. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so yeah, you'll find most things on our on our website, which is redtensisters.com. And that's where you'll find all the information around the programs that we offer. And yes, our, our YouTube videos are posted on our blog there. And then we also have what we call our sister site, which is our e-commerce store. And that's ecosex.ca. Make sure you go to .ca.com. We'll take you to a very different website. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter and all those things um, at Red Ten Sisters. Okay. And, of course, all of that information you'll find in the show notes, which will be at fertilityfriday.com slash 34. So thanks again, Kim, for being here. It was so much fun. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You can always find me on Twitter at Fertile Friday. Uh, You can stop by the blog and leave a comment in the show notes for today's episode, which you'll find at fertilityfriday.com slash 34, the number 34. You can also find me on the Fertility Friday Facebook fan page, which is facebook.com slash Fertility Fridays with an S. And you can also come and come on over and join the Fertility Friday Facebook group, which you'll find at fertilityfriday.com slash community. 
And of course, if you've been enjoying the podcast, please look for it on iTunes and leave a five star review and a rating so more people can find it. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.